my vision swims in and out of focus, a kaleidoscope of white light and hazy figures. Groaning, I try to pry my eyes open wider, but some heavy force compels them shut, like lead weights stitched to my lids. Easy there, soldier. A woman's voice, smooth and steady. The hand on my shoulder is gentle, yet it carries an undeniable authority. You've had quite the extended nap. Extended nap? I try to speak, but my mouth refuses to comply. It's like my tongue is thick with cotton. It'll all come back to you, she assures me. Just give it time. Your body's been through a lot. Through a lot? My head throbs like a drumbeat, a deep, primal pain that makes me want to scream, or vomit, or both. I try flexing my fingers, my arms, and a jolt of electricity rips through my limbs. I wouldn't try moving too much yet. You need to calibrate. Your muscles have been dormant too long, she cautions. We're going to take it slow, okay? Her voice holds the calming lilt of a mother soothing a scared child. My mind flashes to a blurry, half-forgotten memory, a woman with warm eyes and a hand on my cheek, but it dissolves as quickly as it surfaces. It's time you woke up, Captain. Her tone shifts. There's a subtle steel to it now, a sliver of command. Captain. The word sparks something in me. It tickles the edges of my consciousness, stirring up dust from a buried chamber of my mind. My eyelids fight harder, spurred by a sense of urgency I can't quite comprehend. That's it. I know it's not easy. There's encouragement in her voice, but behind it lies a hint of tension. My eyes crack open, the light slicing through like shards of ice. Blinking hard, I try to form a picture from the chaotic shapes. A sterile room with glaring, antiseptic overhead lights. Two figures in clean white uniforms hunched over a bank of monitors that beep and flash. I am strapped down to what seems like a medical table. A cold shiver runs through me. Where the heck am I? My mind finally clicks into place. The last thing I remember before this was. Battlefield carnage. Explosions. The searing heat of enemy fire. My men. My men scattering, their screams drowned by the roar of alien weaponry. And the acrid, metallic tang of fear filling my nostrils. The woman leans in closer, blocking out some of the painful fluorescent glare. My eyes adjust, and I make out her features the crisp uniform, the short, no-nonsense haircut, a pair of deeply concerned eyes. My name is Dr. Sato. Do you recall anything, Captain? Her voice is laced with cautious hope. My name. It comes to me in a flash. Pierce, I rasp, my throat like sandpaper. Captain Jacob Pierce. Yes. She exclaims, a touch of triumph in her voice. Jacob, can you remember what happened? I close my eyes, and the images flood back. The alien onslaught, a wave of monstrous creatures with acid for blood, claws like sides, and a hunger in their eyes that mirrored the terror in our own. We fought. Boy, did we fight with everything we had. Yet it wasn't enough. Outnumbered. Outgunned. And most chillingly, outsmarted. Then there was only the sting of defeat. The bitter taste of failure. The searing shame. We lost, I managed to choke out. It feels like an anvil has been dropped on my soul. Yes, Jacob. We did, she admits without sugarcoating it. The war is going poorly. They took out our fleet. Wiped out most of our leaders. What's left of our forces are in disarray. A flicker of panic dances in the pit of my stomach. Then it ignites into an inferno of rage. My fingers twitch against the restraints. Those slimy, chittering bastards, I growl, the words bubbling out from a place choked with fury and frustration. My jaw slackens. If the war is lost, if our fleet is destroyed, that means. Years must have passed. My body begins to tremble, though whether it's from weakness or the terrifying implication of it, I'm not sure. What year is it? I force the words out. Time feels viscous, like I'm wading through molasses. Dr. Sato's expression grows somber. She exchanges a worried glance with the other figure in the room, a man with weathered features and the haunted look of someone who stared into the abyss and seen it stare right back. It's 2187, Jacob, she says. My stomach lurches. A wave of nausea and disbelief crashes over me. 2187? Over a century and a half. Impossible. I scoff, or at least I try to, the sound coming out more like a desperate wheeze. You must be. Mistaken. I wish I were, Dr. Sato sighs. But the records are clear. You've been in cryostasis for over 152 years. Cryostasis. The word triggers another fragment of memory, a press conference. 
flashing lights buzzing in my face. Me, standing at the podium addressing the world. My words, full of defiant confidence, ringing through the chamber. If the worst should happen, there are contingency plans. Failsafes. So, this is my failsafe. Frozen like a lab experiment, tucked away in some forgotten bunker while everything went to hell outside. A new kind of desperation gnaws at me. My men. What about my men? Dr. Sato and the man avoid my gaze. My blood turns to ice. They. Didn't make it, she says quietly. The words hit me like a ton of bricks. A howl of anguish tears from my throat. The restraints bite into my wrists as I thrash against them. It's a primal, animal sound, full of grief and a fury I couldn't begin to contain. The room spins. My vision blurs with tears, hot and stinging. Michael. Torres. Lee. The faces of the soldiers who trusted me, who followed me into the jaws of that nightmare, gone. Wiped from existence. All because I failed them. No. No. I choke out. The taste of bile floods my mouth. It's okay, Captain, Dr. Sato tries to soothe me, her voice laced with a sympathy that feels like a razor's edge against my raw emotions. Your sacrifice was not in vain. They bought us time. Her words trail off, and the unspoken truth hangs heavy in the air. Not enough time. Exhaustion washes over me. My body slumps against the restraints, every fiber of my existence burning with loss. But even in that desolate darkness, a flicker of stubbornness remains. Tell me everything, I say, my voice now a hollow rasp. I need to know what I'm facing. Dr. Sato hesitates. It's not pretty, Jacob. The world is. Different now. The aliens, they've tightened their grip. We've been driven underground. We're more resistance than army. I clench my fists, every muscle screaming in protest. The urge to rage, to fight back, is overwhelming. And why the thaw? Why bring me back into this? Because, the weathered man steps forward, his voice surprisingly firm, we're out of options. Our last general was eliminated last month. The resistance is on its knees. We needed you, Captain Pierce. Needed your leadership. Needed that fire that burned back when the world still believed we had a chance. The words strike me like a slap to the face. Needed me. Leadership. That fire. It's a flicker deep within me, a fading ember against the hurricane of despair and loss. But something about the man's ragged determination, something in his eyes that mirrors the desperation I feel burning in my own gut, stirs a long dormant instinct. I sit up straighter, mustering a strength I don't truly possess. Every move feels like wading through quicksand, but I force my voice to find some semblance of its old steel. Tell me about the enemy. Their strengths, weaknesses. Any intel we have on their operations. Dr. Sato and the man, I learn his name is General Cole, exchange a relieved glance. It's a small flicker of hope in the pervasive bleakness, and I cling to it like a lifeline. Follow me, Cole says, his voice brusque, efficient. He leads me out of the sterile medical room, the rhythmic beeping of machinery fading behind us. We move through a maze of utilitarian corridors, a network of tunnels carved into the heart of what I assume is the resistance's subterranean stronghold. The air is stale and recycled, heavy with a sense of resigned desperation. Faces peer out from the shadows, gaunt and war-weary, but a spark of recognition ignites in their eyes as I pass. Whispers follow me, Pierce. It's really him. The weight of their hope presses down on my shoulders. Heavy. Suffocating. Am I truly the savior they think I am? I, who failed so catastrophically the last time. We emerge into a chamber that serves as the resistance's command center. Flickering holographic maps display a grim picture, alien strongholds marked in pulsing red, scattered across a world I barely recognize. Scattered pinpricks of light mark what remains of humanity, pockets of defiance surrounded by a sea of subjugation. General Cole motions for me to sit. Here's what we know. He begins, and I see the toll of the last century and a half on his face, etched in the lines creasing his brow, the weariness that sags his shoulders. As he details the aliens' technological superiority, their brutal tactics, and their seemingly unstoppable advance, a strategic part of my mind awakens. It's the same part that calculated trajectories, analyzed battlefield patterns, and weighed odds I knew were dire even in my most optimistic days. A plan begins to coalesce, hazy at first, but gaining sharpness as I dissect the information. My fingers itch for a pen and paper, the tactile process of mapping out strategy that fueled so many desperate plans back in the day. The familiar rhythm of problem-solving pushes back the despair, just a little. And their command hive, 
that's their heart. Take that out, and we have a chance, Cole concludes, hope warring with grim pragmatism in his voice. I know what he's not saying. Taking out their central hive, it's a long shot. A crazy, reckless, next to impossible long shot. And tell me about our forces, I press. Not expecting much. Dr. Sato steps forward with a data pad. Not an army anymore, Captain. We have scattered cells, operating independently. Communication is near impossible across regions. Ground-to-air combat is all but useless against their ships. A familiar wave of hopelessness crashes against the shores of my budding resolve. If we lack even basic coordination, how the hell are we going to make a dent in this alien machine? Yet, there's still that flicker. That stubborn refusal to give in. I push down the doubts, the voice telling me that this is madness, and focus on the task at hand. We may not have an army, I state, surveying the grim faces gathered around the command table, but we have one hell of a problem. And I learned a long time ago that desperate times call for. My voice trails off, searching for the right word. Cole finishes my thought, a grim smile cracking his weary features, desperate measures. I scan the faces around me, half expecting them to look at me like I've gone completely mad. Back in my day, desperate measures meant digging in, rationing supplies, making every bullet, every ounce of fuel, every soldier count tenfold. Guerrilla tactics, hit and runs, sacrificing territory to conserve strength. It was a brutal calculus of survival, but it was the only calculus we had. We leverage the terrain, I begin, falling back on old, familiar patterns. Bottleneck their forces. Use our limited manpower more intelligently. We'll need to adapt. Adapt? Cole interrupts, a hint of skepticism in his voice. Captain, forgive me, but you were frozen before they even made landfall. The rules of warfare have changed entirely. A flicker of shame burns within me. Of course, they have. To them, my tactical advice from a century and a half ago probably sounds as primitive as discussing cavalry charges in the age of tanks. What are we working with? I ask, trying to mask the knot of embarrassment tightening in my chest. Show me your arsenal. Sato and Cole exchange uneasy glances. This, I know, is where the reality of how far I've fallen behind will hit home. Standard issue for ground units is no longer projectile weapons, Sato explains with a touch of pity. Energy-based, short to mid-range. Ammo is scarce, clunky. We focus on stealth, hit-and-run tactics. Her words trail off, and it's General Cole who takes pity on me. Come on, Captain. Let's show you the new reality of war. He leads me through a winding corridor to an armory that makes my jaw drop. Gone are the clunky assault rifles, the grenades, and the bulky packs my soldiers had lugged into battle. Sleek, bio-integrated suits that pulse with an inner luminescence line the walls. Hovering weapon platforms hang suspended, shimmering with latent energy, their alien design a stark contrast to the utilitarian killing machines of my past. Cole gestures towards a display case. This is a standard issue pulse rifle. Fires concentrated bursts of plasma energy. Self-recharges with exposure to. Well frankly, we don't fully understand the power source ourselves. Salvaged alien tech. He grimaces. We've learned to turn their own weapons against them, but the supply is unpredictable. My fingers itch to touch the gleaming metal and glowing coils, to dissect the unfamiliar form in my hands. It's a leap forward in technology that I can barely begin to comprehend. A humbling realization washes over me. I'm not just out of time, I'm out of my league. But that stubborn ember in my gut refuses to be extinguished. So, resource scarcity is still an issue, I point out, latching onto a familiar problem amidst the unfamiliarity. What about aerial combat? Cole's face turns grim. Non-existent. Anything we try to put in the sky gets swatted down like a fly. Their dominance in the air is absolute. My mind races. If we can't fight them in the air. And heavier vehicles? Armored ground units? Sato shakes her head. Too easily tracked. We've lost entire divisions to targeted orbital strikes. Targeted orbital strikes. The words hang in the air heavy with defeat. In my day, air superiority was a hard-fought prize that still left you vulnerable on the ground. This. This is a whole different ballgame. Just as the scale of the challenge begins to crush me, I recall Cole's words. We needed you, Captain Pierce. Needed your leadership. Needed that fire. I may be a dinosaur, a relic of a bygone era, but if they need the fire, then that's what I'll give them. And a true leader adapts. I force my shoulders back, my chin up. Time to show them what an old dog can still do. 
a surge of determination courses through my veins. I may be outmatched, but I'm not outclassed. Okay, no air support, heavy armor is a liability. So we need to rethink this, I say, pacing across the armory, my mind whirling with possibilities. What about close quarters specialization? Own environments? General Cole nods. We've had some success there. Our squads have developed ambush tactics, dismantling their patrols unit by unit. But it's slow. Attrition. We can't win that way. But what about scaling it up? Can we? I stop short as a thought strikes me, a sliver of possibility amidst the bleakness. Can we disrupt their command structure? Hit them at their nerve center? Their command hives are fortresses, Captain, Sato interjects. Impenetrable shields, defenses honed from conquering thousands of planets. That's when it hits me. Shields. What powers them? What do we know about their energy signatures? That's. Cole hesitates, a flicker of surprise crossing his face. That's actually a question we haven't fully explored. We've been focused on just blasting through them, to little success. A grin begins to spread across my face. We might have something here. Tell me, do you have specialists in signal analysis, electromagnetic spectrum experts? Sato nods cautiously. Some. Our research division is small, but we do have people working on understanding alien tech. Then that's our lead, I say, my voice gaining intensity. If their fortresses rely on something like energy shields, then there must be some way to exploit that. A way to tear them down, even for a short while. Get me to your specialists, I order, a fire I haven't felt in over a century igniting within me. And tell me, I pause, a glimmer of an outrageous idea forming in my mind, do any of your fancy suits have stealth capabilities? Dr. Sato furrows her brow in confusion, but Cole's weathered face lights up. We do, as a matter of fact. But there. Delicate. The cloaking field dissipates when exposed to sudden heat or high concentrations of electromagnetic waves. Maximum duration is about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Not much, but it might be just enough. The beginnings of a plan, still hazy and fraught with risk, crystallizes in my mind. We take the fight to them, I declare, a fierce grin spreading across my face. We infiltrate, we sabotage, and we bring the whole damn hive crashing down around them. Now that. I gesture at the sleek suits and the outlandish weaponry, that's something I can work with. The resistance fighters around me stare, uncertainty warring with the first sparks of genuine hope on their faces. It's a long shot, a plan so audacious that it borders on insane. But in the face of annihilation, perhaps a little insanity is exactly what's called for. I spend the next several hours locked in the research division, a whirlwind of activity swirling around me. Technicians hunch over consoles, their fingers blurring across holographic interfaces. Stacks of data pads are littered across tables, filled with waveforms and energy readouts that make my head swim with their complexity. But amidst the chaos, there's a palpable shift in the air, a spark of purpose, replacing the despair that had permeated this hidden base. Dr. Sato and General Cole flank me, their initial skepticism giving way to a cautious optimism. My plan is taking shape, growing bolder with every new piece of information we glean about the alien hive's defenses. There. I point at a swirling mass of data on the main holographic display. That spike in electromagnetic readings, see. That lines up with shield recharge cycles. That's our window of vulnerability. It's narrow, Captain, Cole cautions. Ten minutes, at best. That's all we need, I counter, a thrum of adrenaline coursing through me. General, I need your fastest, stealthiest unit prepped and ready. Sato, we need to calibrate and jury rig as many of those stealth suits as possible. I sketch out the plan, my voice a rapid-fire stream of tactics and contingencies learned in blood and fire. We'll hit them from the south, hard and fast. Draw their main forces away from the hive. That's when our stealth unit snakes in, takes out their shield generators, and creates the window. After that, I gesture towards a smaller screen filled with the complex schematics of the alien hive's interior. That's their power core. One well-placed sabotage, and the whole damn thing goes sky high. One well-placed sabotage, Cole repeats, his eyes gleaming with a grim determination. You make it sound so simple, Captain. It won't be, I admit. We'll lose people, good people. But right now, it's our best chance. Maybe our only chance to strike a crippling blow. The room falls silent as the weight of the decision, my decision, hangs heavy in the air. These fighters, they're looking to me for the hope I'm barely holding onto myself. We can't keep bleeding forever, I say, 
my voice low but unyielding. Sometimes, to win, you have to risk it all. Sato and Cole exchange long looks. Finally, Cole nods. You have your orders, Captain. We put everything into this. Everything, I echo, the word sharp as a blade. I turn to face the technicians working frantically around us. People. I call out, my voice ringing with a newfound authority, an authority forged in the depths of desperation. What we do here, is more than just following orders, more than just a fight. Right now, we're holding the fate of humankind in our hands. Every bit of data, every line of code, it counts. We fail here, we fail everywhere. A chorus of determined voices echoes back. They're not just technicians or fighters anymore. In that moment, we're an army forged anew from the ashes of defeat, and fueled by the same stubborn flame that burns brightly within me. Hours bleed into an endless blur of preparation and adrenaline-fueled focus. The distraction force preps their assault, noisy, flashy, and ready to sacrifice everything for the cause. I handpick the stealth team, each soldier a ghost with haunted eyes and a steely resolve that mirrors my own. The technicians work tirelessly, their exhaustion masked by a desperate hope. Finally, the moment arrives. Our distraction force explodes onto the battlefield south of the hive, a whirlwind of noise and fury designed to draw the aliens out of their fortress like wasps from a disturbed nest. Explosions light up the night sky as our fighters engage, every blast a beacon of defiance. My stomach churns. It's a calculated gamble, sending people I barely know into that meat grinder. But war has always demanded brutal math. One life, ten lives, a hundred, weighed against the survival of thousands. Through the calm's link, I can hear the roar of the battle, the crackle of alien weaponry meeting the desperate shouts of my soldiers. It's a gut-wrenching symphony of chaos, each fallen comrade a dagger to my own heart. Stealth team, move out. I bark, barely recognizing my own hoarse voice. Under cover of the raging battle, six figures, barely visible shimmers in the gloom, slip through the lines and into the heart of the beast. I guide them through back channels, exploited gaps gleaned from hours of scrutinizing hive schematics. We time it perfectly, the shield flickers out as planned, momentarily exposing the hulking generators. Two minutes to reach target, I snap into the link, timing every precious second. Sato, status on shield recharge? Three minutes and counting, Captain, she replies, her voice tight. Inside the hive, it's bedlam. My stealth team moves like wraiths, exploiting the momentary chaos as alien defenders scramble. Yet, the gamble of those imperfect suits proves too great. An errant energy blast and a stray heat sensor later, three of their cloaks malfunction, revealing them in a flash of shimmering distortion. The alien war cry, a chilling screech that cuts through the calms, tells me everything. Now it's a race against time. My three exposed soldiers become heroes in an instant. They fight like cornered demons, buying precious seconds for their cloaked comrades. The aliens pay heavy prices for every inch of the generator room floor. Their snarls, the thud of bodies, the screams, a testament to the ferocity of humankind cornered, fighting for its very existence. One minute to recharge. Sato's voice cuts through the chaos, a jarring countdown. In that minute, the floor of the generator room becomes a tableau of carnage. One of my soldiers, a kid I barely knew the name of, goes down under a swarm of clawed beasts. Another, a fearless woman with fire in her eyes, takes a blast meant for her comrade, her defiant scream cut short. Then, a flicker of hope. Generators primed. Detonators in place. It comes through the calms, choked with exertion and triumph. Two figures, still cloaked, scramble out just as the shields surge back up. Detonate. I scream into the calms. The hive shudders. A rumble reverberates through the ground, shaking the command center where I stand. Then, a blast of searing light bursts forth, the alien's impregnable fortress crumbling from within. Shockwaves rip outward, and for a breathtaking moment, the world seems to go silent. And then, cheers. The cheers erupt around me, a wave of defiant elation crashing against the bleak walls of our subterranean stronghold. For the first time in over a century, there's genuine hope dancing in the eyes of the battered resistance fighters. We did it. We struck a blow, a blow that may turn the tide. Yet, as the adrenaline recedes, I find myself standing apart from the celebration. A hollowness claws at my insides, a strange echo of both triumph and loss. My fallen soldiers, their faces still fresh in my mind, weigh heavily on my conscience. Dr. Sato and General Cole find me staring at the now smoldering ruins of the alien hive, my expression a mask of exhaustion and troubled thought. 
You did it, Captain, Sato says, her voice tinged with awe and a relief she can't quite hide. We did it, I correct her gently. It wasn't just my plan, but the sacrifices, the unwavering belief of everyone who fought alongside me that snatched this victory from the jaws of despair. Cole nods, a battle-scarred ghost of a smile crossing his face. You were right. We needed that fire. He offers a worn hand, and I grasp it firmly. Gratitude and a newfound respect flow between us. Yet, in my heart, annoying unease settles. The victory feels bittersweet. I've been awoken to a world that has moved on without me, a soldier fighting a war he's long since been declared lost in. As the cheers around me fade into the night, I find myself alone once more. Not in a sterile medical room, but amidst the remnants of a war-torn future I barely comprehend. I stare up at the sky, a sky scarred by battles of which I've seen only glimpses. The stars seem unfamiliar, the constellations patterns I no longer recognize. And then it hits me, the full weight of the situation. Even with this victory, the war is far from over. It has evolved, changed shape and form in my absence. I'm a relic, a man out of time, a leader without a true understanding of the battlefield he now faces. General Cole's words echo in my mind, we needed that fire. But how long can an old flame truly burn in a world that doesn't need its kindling anymore? What good is a captain if he doesn't truly command? I walk back into the depths of the resistance base, head held high, but a question mark burns bright in the darkness behind my eyes. I have given them hope, a taste of victory. But can I give them what they truly need? Can I lead them onwards into an uncertain future I no longer fully belong in?